but you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. Scripture reading, it's from John 10, verses 22 to 42. Then came the festival of dedication in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us, plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you. But you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish parents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you and me and man claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If you call them gods, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why did you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said I am God's son. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do that, even though you do not believe me, believe the works. That you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. I apologize for my lateness. Thank you. It's, it's always nice when most of the service is written out and you, you can, someone can just sit, uh, come up and lead in that regards. Uh, for those of you who have no clue, the sermon isn't written out by, in what I send to Ruth. So whatever she says from this, if, she, if I ever get to the point where I'm not here for the sermon and Ruth is doing the sermon, it is her, God's work through her that is in her good listening that, will, that she will be sharing with you. Um, when we look at, at the scripture here from the Gospel of John, and as we, we continue on through the Gospel of John, we see certain themes that come up. And the one thing that stands out is the, the theme of, of knowing, but also the theme of belonging, of, of having membership, of being part of something. And when I was younger, I used to play soccer. My parents thought that putting me in soccer was a good idea. Uh, I realized that my greater strengths in soccer were not scoring goals, even though I had one coach that thought I should be up front. And I, was, I liked to be on defense and try to stop. I didn't actually, I don't think I scored my first goal until I was uh, playing pickup soccer in Chesterville a number of years ago. 
There is a little bit of a discrepancy on the amount of time I played younger over years, and in Chesterville is over a matter of a two years at the most, I think. But we look at, in both places, I signed up and they accepted me. No problems, no questions asked. I later went on to baseball and we, if you know a little bit about baseball, there's nine different positions, well, let's put, there's 10 positions that you can play. And I use the word play a little bit loosely on the 10th one, and we'll get to that one. That I play just about every position Maybe not in a game. Um, in practice, once I, the coach allowed me to pra- to uh, pitch, he quickly got me out of there to save the batter. Uh, thankfully, it was just little foam ball, weighted a little bit. They're foam balls, but uh, a little bit more weighty than just uh, your your spongy foam. But even in baseball. I could sign up for the house league, and they would find a place for me. They realized that my ability to throw was not my strength. My ability to catch just about everything was a lot better, so they put me on first base. However, when I had to throw back to the picture, it was always, I had no idea where the ball was going, to tell you the truth. There was a lot of prayer going on at that point in time. But at one one point in time in my baseball career, uh, one year, all my friends were were playing baseball, and they got on to the house or to the uh, the traveling team, the competitive team. It wasn't just house league. It wasn't just sign up, pay your money, and be on the team. You had to have a certain profic- proficiency. And the coach came to me in early on in the season and said, "You can stay with this team and play." But most of it's going to be on the bench, hence the 10th position. Or you can go down a year and play on the house league team on the year below. I ended up going to the year below and and playing there. But not everything that we do and that that we want to be a part of, that we say that we want to be part of, we can be part of. We can pay our money and become Costco membership or membership card holders. They take your picture, they put it on a card, and they say that you have the right to come in and spend your money here. It's, and usually they encourage you to spend lots. They, they make it, they like it a lot easier with the bigger carts. And then they put the really expensive stuff at the beginning so that everything else looks a lot cheaper. More reasonable, I guess. But there's other places that they have to test you to make sure that you actually have the qualifications that you do. Whether it's to become a doctor or a nurse or a firefighter, they want to make sure that you have the skills to do what they are expecting you to be able to do. And it gives us, on the other side of that, a sense of comfort and security knowing that, they, that those people who have passed the test have some clue on what they're doing, especially when it comes to our lives. Whether it's the doctor prescribing medication or or doing surgery, you hope that they have a clue of what they're doing and they have proficiency with it. And it's even better if they have done it before and the previous people have come out on top. Just there's there's a a little bit of security and, and a comfort to that. So we, we like it when people aren't just accepted in because they say they want to be. They, they're not just accepted in because they think that would be a good idea. But they have to actually prove that they have those qualifications. When we come to this section of Scripture, the people that Jesus is speaking to in Jerusalem at Solomon's colonnade, ask him, as, well, when we go through the Gospel of John, this question here might seem like a silly question. Let me be honest with you. I've asked silly questions before. I've been told that. And people are looking at me and say, there are no silly questions. 
They keep asking the same question over and over of Jesus. Prove it. Are you, and they ask this question, are you the, the Messiah? Tell us plainly. And as I mentioned before, we can go through the Gospel of John, and one of the themes is about knowing. Do the people who know really know? In chapter 9, as we just read a couple of weeks ago, there was a contrast between those who could see and know and those who were blind and knew. That the religious leadership condemned Jesus, and even the blind man who Jesus gave him sight, and the blind man who now has sight because of Jesus, proclaimed that, Je- that, that the healing was from God, that Jesus was from God. And yet, as we continue through the Gospel of John, there is a question of how do you know? Jesus continues to point to the people, or point the people to Scripture, to, to help them to hear what he's saying and say, is this lining up with Scripture? Does this make sense from what we have heard and what we know that the Messiah would do? What kind of person the Messiah would be? He even goes as far to point to to his heavenly father and say, I'm not doing this by my own accord. I'm doing what my father has told me to do. And if you check the scriptures, it kind of lines up. It lines up perfectly if you look hard enough. And to the common person, that might be a little bit hard to hear. But a lot of the times, Jesus is being challenged, not by the common person, but by someone who has studied the scriptures inside and out for years. So this has been their life, uh, their whole life's work. They have argued with other rabbis about the scriptures. They have learned how, how to draw closer to God through the scriptures. And the question keeps coming up. Prove it. Now, to be fair, we also have to remember that as we look at the the questions that people have, John the Baptist, by the way, John the Baptist's last name was not the Baptist. It's just a reference we make to differentiate him from the other uh, Johns that are out there. John the Baptist, who, who professed and proclaimed to those around him as Jesus was being baptized, that he is the one that he had been speaking about, that one that would come after, after him, that would be greater than him, that he proclaimed that Jesus was in not as many words, but essentially pointing to the Messiah, that Jesus was the Messiah, he himself even had a moment of doubt. And he asked a disciple of his to go and ask Jesus, Are you truly the one we have been waiting for? Or is there someone else? And Jesus responds by pointing to Scripture. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the oppressed are freed. Pointing to what the work of the Messiah would do. And he's saying these things are happening. These things are happening in your midst. These things are happening in our midst. And it brought comfort to John. And yet when Jesus does this to others, to the the people that he is speaking to, they struggle to hear. And Jesus says to them plainly, not what they wanted to hear, but he challenges their understanding of their faith and where they were at that point in time. I did tell you, But you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Now, in some instances, a surface reading of this, we could say that he is speaking to the crowd, and in the crowd there are many different people. And it was commonplace where rabbis would come together and debate And a rabbi, a teacher, has disciples that follow him, that follow his teaching, that want to learn from him, that have, that he has accepted to follow, that he has seen something of worth in them, that they have 
a certain knowledge or a proficiency with the scriptures and can learn and take in the learning and expand on the learning. So on a surface reading, it could just be a debate between rabbis and their disciples, and he's saying that you are not part of my disciples, and that's okay. We could look at that. I wouldn't, because I would go farther in the scriptures, and it says that the problem is not a debate between rabbis. It is not a debate about uh, teachers disagreeing with each other. It is a debate about who Jesus is claiming to be. That Jesus, that they, they want to pick up the stones and stone him because, that he, because he is claiming to be God. And this is evidence throughout the majority of the Gospel of John. We see this uh, very clearly in John. And when, when Jesus is making the I am statements, he makes a number of I am statements. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd, as we read last week. These I am statements might not seem as, as, as a, a clear declaration of, of his theological and, and heritage, because we use I am a lot. I am a father. I am a son. Others would say, I am a wife, or I am a daughter, or I am a, a, a doctor. I am is used multiple times. It is used over and over again. So when we hear I am, we just think it's a description. And yet, when Jesus is saying these things, when Jesus is making these declarations, it is hearkening back to Exodus chapter 3, where Moses asks God, who do I say is sending me? As God is sending Moses to, to his people in Egypt who are in slavery. And God says, I am who I am. Yudhe vahe. That's my best Hebrew, and that's most Hebrew I know, actually. So God is saying, I am who I am. Some translate it as I am will be who I will be. Essentially, when people are hearing Jesus say, I am the good shepherd, it's, you have that connection between Exodus chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 34, where God is making that declaration that he will be his people's shepherd because the other shepherds have failed. When he says, I am the light of the world, I am the bread of life, I am the one who is giving to his people. That is a clear, uh, a clear statement that rubs a number of people the wrong way and creates this idea of blasphemy in their hearts because they do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that, Je that they do not believe that Jesus is at the very least from God, let alone being God. And this is a problem. And yet Jesus goes and he quotes from Scripture from uh, Psalm 82, which we read a little bit earlier, which talks about people being uh, gods or the, and sons of the Most High. So when Jesus uses similar language and they condemn him for using that language... And he points out, you hold the scriptures that say these things. And the scriptures cannot be denied. And yet, you are denying the scriptures. How can you condemn me for saying this when you hold the scriptures to be true and the scriptures themselves say this? Now, the irony of this, I'm not, he doesn't necessarily, the, the, the problem is, is when he's making this reference, I have said you are gods. You could take it as he's referring to himself or that he's actually referring to the people he's talking to. And if you, and I, I say this because as we read through in uh, eight, Psalm 82, he talks about the gods know nothing. 
They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. There is that contrast between knowing and not knowing, about being accepted, about being welcomed, and not being welcomed. So as the people are not listening, they're not hearing Jesus, they're not believing that Jesus is the Son of God, and yet Jesus is saying to them, you're not actually following God because you're not listening to God. You're not trusting his words. You are not trusting what he has said in the scriptures, which you hold dear, which you say are essentially written in stone, cannot be denied, cannot be turned back. And you are condemning me for saying that I am God's son, even though the scriptures reference being called God's son. And that the scriptures also tell you what the Messiah will do and what that will look like. And you are denying most of what I have been doing. Jesus is is trying to point out the hypocrisy of the people that are condemning him. That it is not a, a, a trial that is exposing truth, but it is a trial based on false beliefs, on a disconnect between God. Because Jesus talks about his own sheep. They know my voice and I know them. You see that relationship, that the people will listen to Jesus, that are his sheep, the people that believe, that trust, that are willing to be vulnerable to him. And we also see that there is a relationship. It's not just a one way. It is a mutual relationship. That it's not that them knowing his voice and knowing what he will say, but he also knows them. Knowing is important. And essentially, Jesus is saying that they don't know God. They say they do. They believe they do. But they're not listening. They're not listening to the scriptures. They're not listening to Jesus. They're not listening to the evidence that has been pointed out and that has happened before their very eyes in some cases. That they don't want to trust what they lay out as evidence, as what they should trust. And Jesus is confronting them on it. You don't trust the scriptures. You don't believe what the scriptures say. And as we go through to the end, as Jesus finishes this discussion and this confrontation, he then leaves after they are trying to seize him again. And he goes beyond the Jordan. And the people there he speaks to also. Now we might not think of the different, the, 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 The contrast here is like, yes, it's two different places. That's obvious. But Jerusalem is the religious center of these people. This is where people would go to worship at the temple. This is where where they believe that the house of God was. That the Holy of Holies is where God's God resided in some, in some instances, or at least his feet could be seen in the temple, as we see in Isaiah chapter 6, in the vision that Isaiah has, as God is calling him into service. That is the religious center of people who study the word of God, who profess faith in God, and do not believe in Jesus. And then Jesus goes out beyond the Jordan, the countryside, the backwoods area. One might say the, uh, the black sheep of the family, the cousin you wanna hide or try to uh, excommunicate from the family because they're a little bit of an embarrassment. And Jesus speaks to them. He's not embarrassed by them. He's not afraid of them. He's not afraid of the people in Jerusalem either. 
But the difference is, the people who shouldn't believe, the people who others would say don't know any better, believe. They believe in Jesus. They follow Jesus. They accept what Jesus has to say. They accept Jesus as the Messiah. They recognize that the message that John had, that though John didn't say, didn't do anything that was miraculous, what he had to say about Jesus, everything had come true. And they believed. Now here's the fun thing about it. We sometimes look down on the, the people that were listening and didn't believe, and we're about ready to crucify Jesus then and there or take him outside the, the city walls and stone him to death as was the custom for blasphemers. Jesus spoke to both, peop- both groups. Jesus didn't elevate one group over another. He didn't look down on one and say, well, this is worthless. He didn't say that this was unimportant. He shared the good news in both places. He shared the good news with those who at times were seen as more socially accepted and those who might have been looked down upon socially, not at the highest rung of the social ladder. He cared for both. He loved both. It wasn't about location, It was about sharing the good news everywhere. We don't hear the numbers. We hear about people's hearts, about people's lives, about how people's lives were changed. That when Jesus opened his mouth, people had the opportunity to believe or reject. Sometimes it's interesting to think about this. Sometimes the people with the most have the hardest time believing because they have the most to lose. We hear about Jesus, or a rich young man coming to Jesus and asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus names off the Ten Commandments, essentially. And the rich young man says, well, I've done all of that. And then Jesus says, go and sell everything you have and come and follow me. The first part was easy. And yet we stumble over it ourselves. And yet when we have that much to lose, Our true values come out. The people that at times were rejecting Jesus were rejecting a way of doing things, a way of thinking. They wanted to see the Messiah, but didn't want to see the Messiah. Because the irony is, too often we pray for the opportunity to see God. And yet, when God appears, we're not quite ready. We're not ready to change our way of doing things. We're not ready to step out in faith and follow God where he leads us. Because sometimes God asks us to do more than we think he would. It's the same invitation, come and follow me. But sometimes it's come and follow me away from what you know and what you're accepted, what you have find comfortable. Sometimes he calls people into lives of poverty to be able to share the good news, to be able to be heard. Sometimes he invites people into lives of great wealth to share the good news and the opportunity to be heard. Sometimes God calls us into places that we are unfamiliar with, share the good news and helps us to be heard. 
But we do so by drawing closer to him, by hearing his voice, by having that relationship with him, with his Holy Spirit, that we will know where he is leading us. He will give us the words to speak and the strength to go. He will open the doors that we need so that we can go through them and serve him. Because here's the thing. He doesn't stop speaking to us. He doesn't say that he only speaks at certain points and times in our lives. My sheep listen to my voice. Not that my sheep have listened, past tense. Not that my sheep will listen, future. But my sheep listen. That is continued conversation. That is continually happening throughout all time. And that he opens the door to eternal life. That even when we face hardship and troubles here in this life, we are not forgotten. We are not cast out. We are not left on the garbage heap to be forgotten about. But he has opened the door to eternal life. He opens the door to a greater relationship. He opens the door to service, to life, to joy, even to struggle, but also to eternal life with him. That that relationship is not just for a moment, it is for all eternity. The question is, will we listen? Or will we be a little bit too comfortable where we are and have trouble to follow because it means going somewhere we're not used to? Even though we might pray the prayer, God, show me the way. We have to be willing to go down it. Who here has seen the movie Evan Almighty? It's a movie that was put out a number of years ago. Um, it's the uh, less risque version that came after Bruce Almighty. Um, Evan Almighty is about a guy who starts looking a lot like Noah at least a, an Americanized version of Noah. And he starts building this ark. And he's listening to God, he's following God, and his wife is looking a little bit perplexed with him. His wife and his kids actually end up on the road to leave, and they stop at a diner, and then they meet Morgan Freeman's character, who Morgan Freeman is playing God. We can talk about whether that's appropriate or not. Uh, a, a person representing God, period. But he has this one question for Evan's wife. If you pray for patience, are you, do you expect to have more patience or the opportunity to be patient? When we pray to see God, do we really want to see God, or do we just want things to be more comfortable? Because if we see God, and God asks us to do something that's outside of our comfort zone, do we really want to see God? If we see God, and God asks us to change, and to trust Him more, and to follow Him more closely, did we really want to see God? Or did we want God to say, you're doing great. Stay where you are. Don't change at all. That's not going with the scriptures. Because the scriptures tell us that we all fall short of the glory of God. The scriptures tell us that we are to follow Jesus wherever he leads us. The scriptures tell us that we are to be transformed. That our sins are to be washed away. And we are to receive God's grace. We, the scriptures tell us that there is a good chance that when God calls us, we will go somewhere where we are not comfortable. Moses going back to Egypt. Amos the prophet. By the way, he was a farmer. Going off to Samaria to preach the word of God to people that didn't really want to hear it. Jonah. 
How many of us remember Jonah? Jonah, very popular guy, liked what he had to do, and then God spoke to him. Go to Nineveh. How many people thought Jonah wanted to go to Nineveh? It was right on his travel plans, his itinerary. He had it written down, penciled in stone. I know that's a contradiction, an oxymoron. He went the other way. Moses tried to have every excuse in the book not to go. But when we meet with God, when we are following God, when we are listening to God, it doesn't matter where he sends us. Because he's there with us. Jesus is there with us. May we have the faith to ask to meet with God and the faith to follow where he leads us each and every day. Amen. Announcements. Friday, March 15th, WMS Presbyterial will be held at St. Paul's Kempville starting at 9.30 a.m. Uh, Thursday, March 21st, our WMS will meet here at the church at 1.30 p.m. Sunday, March 24th, our annual meeting will follow the morning service and a potluck sandwich finger food lunch. Uh, Bible study continues on Monday mornings at 10... It's actually 10 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've been having trouble with stuff also, so... I had a few slides out of, out of whack at, uh, in Winchester, and I'm not sure how they got out of whack. Uh, yeah, 10 o'clock at St. Andrews in Chesterville. Uh, there's also one Friday mornings, 10 a.m. at Winchester. Uh, any other announcements? That's it? Yes. Well, I said it last week, but for anybody who wasn't here, um, for our memorial service, we send out an invitation every year. And we know, we've got a list about this long of invitations that we send out. We know there are probably a whole lot more people in the community who aren't receiving our invitations and who might like to come. Um, so if you know of anyone who doesn't normally come but has someone in our cemetery, I put a book at the back on the little table at the entrance. Just leave their name and address, and I'll gladly send them an invitation. Can I just ask you a question? Sure. Um, would we be able to put like a notice up down in the store in Norway? Well, the Norway service? Yeah, probably. And what day is the memorial service this year? It's the second Sunday in June. Okay. Whatever date that is. June 9th, I believe. Very good. Alrighty. So if there's no other announcements, let's pray. Gracious God, we... We recognize that there are times when we ourselves have doubts and we, we have fears about what it means to follow you. And yet, Lord, we have seen your faithfulness to watch over those who do follow you. Lord, it doesn't mean that our lives will be easy. It doesn't mean that we will be kept from harm. It does mean that you will be there with us and that we will have that strong relationship with you. That you speak to us all the days of our lives, that you care for us and fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you strengthen us in times of trouble, that you give us the words to speak, that others might hear of your, of your grace, of your love, of the hope that we have in you. Lord, we, we lift up to you the families that are mourning the death of loved ones, Lord, we hear in the news of such tragedies, and we struggle to make sense of why. Lord, we hear about, about killings, and we wonder, why, why can't we love each other? Why can't we have peace and allow life to flourish? 
Why must the brokenness and hatred and, and sin of our world cause so much despair? Lord, we struggle with things that many times we don't have any clue on how to deal with. We ask the questions and we don't always hear the answers we want to hear. But Lord, your word reminds us that you love all of your creation. And that Jesus has come not to condemn, but to bring forgiveness, to bring healing into the world. Lord, we pray that as we, as we live lives that are honoring and glorifying to you, that as we go into the tough areas of our lives, to be with people who are broken, who are struggling, to help out and to, to carry the burden that others cannot. Help us, Lord. Help us to stay true to you. Help us to not give up when the, the road gets tougher and tougher. Help us to not give in to anger or hatred. Help us to not become hard-hearted or emptied. But help us to rely on you, the one who fills us up with living water, the one who restores our souls, the one who nourishes us, and blesses us. Lord, we pray for peace. Peace in our communities. Peace around the world. Where there is fighting, may it cease. Where there are weapons of destruction, maybe they be turned in to tools of life. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Our mission moment this morning. For hundreds of years, roads have been providing important networks of connection and community, not only in a physical sense, but by creating equal access to vital places like schools, churches, and hospitals, and fostering a sense of community. With spirit, or excuse me, with support from Presbyterian Sharing, the Life and Mission Agency, and the Band Council of Mistawasis, Plains Cree Reserve in Northern Saskatchewan, are working together to create a road system through the reserve that will connect Mistawasis Memorial Presbyterian Church with the rest of the community. In, excuse me. in turn, it will open up the possibilities of new ministry opportunities by bringing together the community and creating a sense of hope and connectedness. Jesus blesses us to be able to bless others so that all may experience the blessing of God no matter who we are or where we are from. Let us give from God's blessing in Christ's grace. Let us give our tithes and our offerings. you have given to us. We know that you provide for us every day. We are learning to trust you with many different parts of our lives, our time, our money, even our wants and desires. 
Lord, as we give to you, we ask that you bless these offerings. Use them to make a difference in the lives of your children and who are needing a little extra encouragement to draw a little closer to you and to have a place where they can connect in community and receive the needs of life. We pray this in Jesus' powerful and grace-filled name. Amen. I invite us to join together as we sing hymn number 772, Christ for the World We Sing. Go next one. There it is. See, I told you. Yeah, but I had the same problem. Okay. In into people's lives with the grace that transforms lives and the world. Send us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. good to be able to join together in worship with you this morning. May God's blessing be with you as we go from this time of worship into the life that God has granted us. May we experience his grace and his joy each and every day. May we be at peace with God, with each other, and with ourselves. Amen.